Take a look at this blurred image. What do you see? To the untrained eye, this image would simply represent color or an example of the abstract. However, a true expert may have the skill to look deeper and see between the blurred lines. And with just a little bit of enhancement, we may be able to uncover the greatest mystery of all time, Brent Rivera. For those who may not know Brent Rivera, he spent most of his time in the mid 2010s dominating the social media scene, mostly over on Vine. These days, we look back on his older content as some of the highest quality cringe ever released, but we fail to remember that at that time, that was peak. When we look at outdated terms like YOLO or swag or uh, troll, we think back to a time when we ourselves exhibited and experienced said behaviors, thereby inducing the cringe that we now experience. But you know who doesn't see things that way? Boom! What's up, guys? And welcome back. Ever since the peak of his career, Brent has seemingly been locked in time, meaning in his mind, if it worked in 2015, who's to say it won't work forever? Hopefully today you'll start to get a better look at all of this, and what a better way to do that than covering what I believe to be the starting point of his demise, Alexander IRL. This is a YouTube Originals movie that came out in 2017, so as far as time is concerned, this is gonna be some top tier Brent content. This movie follows two brothers, one who just wants to be cool and throw an epic party, and one who wants to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. But hey, without giving away too much information, I just say we hop in and get this over with. The film opens to Brent, who plays Alex, staring at this girl low in class, accompanied by a blinding amount of lens flare. Were you just staring at me? Uh, What's what? going on over there, Lowe? Oh God, please, no. Well, there's Jason Nash right off the bat, so it looks like we got a criminal in the cast. As all things go in movies for bad people, Alex being a pervert pays off. I have been in love with you forever. Are you serious? I thought you didn't know I existed. How could I not notice a guy in our grade who has a thousand views on his last League of Legends stream? Guys, this is a minute and a half into the movie. Minute and a half. Lowe reveals that her phone background is a picture of Alex in space, and then we get transported into space with Alex where Lowe shows up to kiss him. Just kidding. Now, normally, I would think a bit like this is really cringy, but because it's been done in countless movies already, it, it just, it's just unoriginal. Naturally, this is super embarrassing for Alex, but Jason Nash's character, Mr. Eskin, finds it super amusing. I mean, I've heard of online dating, but this is redonkulous. <laughs> The cold floor of the jail cell awaits. Mr. Eskin then introduces the class to their final project assignment, Multimedia Me. I would explain what that means, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We then cut back to earlier that morning where Alex is consuming some good old content from his friends at school. He looks through a couple posts, but it's very clear from his dialogue that the filmmakers didn't really give a shit about it making sense. So No. What do you mean, what, no? That is a response that you give in utter disbelief. So in order for that to make sense, we would have to assume that until now, Alex didn't know that one of his best friends actually existed in real life. Schizophrenia. We then move across the wall where we meet, oh shit, Nathan Kress. Their parents are getting ready to go on a week-long anniversary vacation, but hold the phone because Nathan Kress is unbelievably yoked. A pretty cliche parents leaving for vacation sequence takes place and the dad leaves them with $200 to spend on food for a week. Um, are you serious? He's gonna blow it all on in-app purchases and zit cream. Uh, you tried beating Candy Crush without the golden pineapple, mister. Wow. Okay. I think even for 2017, this reference is super out of touch. Also, if you've ever spent a single cent on a Candy Crush in-app purchase, I'm just gonna have to assume that your entire personality is crafted from morning television. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. After the parents leave, we cut to EJ at work, and he's important because he's wearing a Bluetooth earpiece. Come on, man. Don't spit in my face and tell me it's raining. You're my go-to guy, brother. Hey, man. Don't talk like that. Now, when I told you EJ was important, I was lying because he's actually the receptionist. Look at this still shot that I found where it looks like EJ's peeing behind the desk while this guy in the background is also grabbing his dick. Insane. And if you're wondering why I put that in there, it's because it's funny. EJ heads into the conference room to drop off the food that he was ordering on his phone call, and that's all he had to do. But instead, he tries to strike up a conversation with the big boss who's in the middle of a conference call, and he gets mad. Uh, then we cut back to class where Lo is wondering how to post in an Instagram photo into a document. Does anyone here know how to paste an Instagram photo into a document? Yes, yes, I mean, yes, I, I know how, I know how. Yeah, glad you know, Alex. That is very hard to do. While Alex comes over to the table, Lowe's friend in plain sight just writes, what a loser on her unbranded tablet. Will you be copying and pasting that one too? We then find out that Lowe has a nail art account with over 70,000 followers. 
Uh, hmm. So this means that she has an entire platform in her hands, but she still can't manage to take a fucking screenshot. Okay. You know, she in this sense is very similar to Mario, a character who has a thick Italian accent, but only ever seems to speak in English. Alex proceeds to embed the Instagram post, but to no one's surprise, that just means copy and paste. Whoa, you were really good at that. How many lives did you take in Vietnam, soldier? Back at the office, we're formally introduced to Ellie and Jonathan. Jonathan is a big business creep asshole, and Ellie is not that. In this scene, Jonathan ruthlessly berates Ellie, telling her that she lacks talent. It's very expositional, but also painfully bright, which feels like an attempt at filling the viewer with as little depression as possible. EJ doodles a picture of himself sitting at a desk with his name on it, which is really just a dumb idea for babies. I would argue that this is how a child fantasizes, except instead of a desk, it's more like a race car bed or a, a battle bus. EJ notices Ellie walking into the room and makes an unnecessarily clumsy attempt to talk to her. EJ! Oh, 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 oh my I'm so God! Hang on, hang on, I got it. Oh, I'm about God. to show you something that's gonna change oh, your life. Okay, I don't have time for more YouTube fail compilations, okay? I have a meeting that I have to go to. Yeah, imagine making fun of YouTube fail compilations while actively performing in an equivalent. EJ claims that he has a billion dollar idea that Ellie can't refuse, so she doesn't. And then we're taken back to the school where we're subjected to dialogue so poor that it feels like it might be domestic terrorism. I have to say, my camera roll from this past year was on a fleek. I mean, me and my sister on stage at Comic-Con? and our family trip to Harry Potter world? Expelliarmus. It was at this point in watching the film for the first time that I noticed two things. First of all, I'm pretty sure that the backing track to this scene is one of the songs that Casey Neistat used to use. And secondly, you'll start to notice that every shot in the film looks like it was color graded using Instagram filters. In this shot, the color of Brent's lips are the exact same shade as this guy's sweater. So if my filter theory isn't true, then I guess Brent is just dying. Alex is super stressed about the multimedia me presentation due to his embarrassing past on social media. He pulls up a few examples and you'll notice that they're all photos that Brent has taken in real life. And this actually makes the film super unique because the filmmakers failed to recognize their own travesty. They were able to actually work in their own idea of cringe. To the viewer, this effectively makes the things that are considered cringe by the film standard less cringy than the actual film, which, you know, that's idiotically brilliant. In the lunchroom, the guys look around comparing themselves to other people until they eventually land on this guy, Cole. And then she said, are you just happy to see me or is that your phone in your pocket? I didn't have my phone. I can't tell if my intuition is correct, but I feel like this guy is or was a YouTuber. And the reason that I think that is because, well, you know, he annoys me. Apparently Cole throws awesome parties that are about to be lit AF, and this gives them the idea to throw an epic party of their own while Alex's parents are out of town. Great. At the office, EJ does the... <sighs> Mm. EJ does this thing, which I hate in movies, which is be overly quirky for way too long before being interrupted in the scene. Camp Town racetracks five miles long. Oh, da do da day. Gonna run all night. Gonna run all day. I bet my money. Ah! Stuff like this always brings me back to my greatest enemy, which is characters saying and doing things that would never happen in real life. Normally, I'd blame the writers for something like this, but this time I am quaking at the idea that this might be improv. Ellie has returned to let EJ know that that every single idea he pitched was actually dog shit, citing ideas like outsmart your fart and lift for couch potatoes. I don't feel a need to explain those because they're not funny. However, he does have one idea that Ellie seems to think is pretty smart. That little gem came to me when my dad started yelling at me for spending all my free time on my cell phone. I thought to myself, what if I could develop an app that would encourage you to go offline, but then also conserve electricity? Okay, it might just be me, but hasn't this idea already been attempted multiple times in multiple different ways? Nickelodeon Worldwide Day of Play is a great example. And there was no encouragement about it. They just turned the fucking channel off. So do you mean to tell me that this is the origin story of- Hold on, you were scrolling for way too long now. While Ellie likes the idea, EJ doesn't have a prototype, so she tells him that he needs to have one ready by Thursday. Oh my God, Thursday? Thur- <sighs> Well, wait, what, what day is it now? Thursday morning then, before the staff meeting. Thursday. Yeah. Okay, great. Cut the scene, Thursday cut the is. scene, stop, cut the scene. In the midst of all of this, EJ has forgotten to pick Alex up at school, forcing him to ride home on the back of Darius's bike. Now here's where the film really starts to entertain me. When the film isn't using YouTube friendly, royalty free music, it features a few original songs that sound like they were written by AI. So in an attempt to keep this video copyright friendly, you know, having fun here, no, nothing bad. I'm gonna read you the lyrics to the songs as they come, which is arguably more entertaining. I don't wanna worry, <laughs> I don't wanna worry about nothing. 
nothing for a while. I just want to play around living like a child with old tunes, <laughs> with old tunes jamming on my Walkman and some Sour Patch Kids and a Coke. Yeah. Thanks, I'll be sure to bump this one at the next youth group meeting. I can give you a little bit of an idea of what it sounds like too, kind of like- And some Sour Patch Kids and a Coke, yeah. <laughs> also, I don't mean to nitpick, but if you eat enough Sour Patch Kids and Coke together, uh, your mouth is gonna be gushing blood. Anyway, EJ returns home and Alex is sitting in the dark all menacingly. Of course, he's mad at EJ because he forgot to pick him up from school, but the reason he forgets makes me wonder if EJ is really even capable of life on his own. Oh, that explains it. I wrote down, pick up Alex on my hand, but it's smudged, so I thought it said, pick up a locks. Bought all this locks for nothing. That sucked. That just sucked so bad. At school the next day, Alex and his friends run statistical searches for things that are fun at parties. I ran a Twitter search for the hashtag sick party. Ooh. They come up with specifically ping pong balls and pinatas, but honestly, just be a human being for a second. I mean, we're talking about high school students here, right? So even if you've never been to a party in your entire life, you know what alcohol is. You know what drugs are. Okay, Stu, search Yelp for party planners. I'll put an ad on Craigslist. Darius? Keep an eye on low Snapchat. Absolutely bizarre behavior. You know, I just gave these guys a lot of shit for their understanding of, you know, being. But I guess I spoke too soon because simultaneously, EJ has been searching for mobile app designers that are fast, cheap, and hot. If you showed me this out of context, I would genuinely think this is a prostitution for beginners tutorial. This ushers in a bizarre montage of audition tapes, some from party goers and some from software developers. Not really sure why people are responding to a Craigslist ad with audition tapes though. Kind of just feels like oversharing, if you ask me. Purging the little ewa, ewa entertainment. And yeah, that was uh, that was Josh Peck. Has he has he done anything bad yet? EJ meets up with this sketchy Ezra Miller variant in an alleyway who promises to develop the app. And the reason I call him an Ezra Miller variant is because of this. You're in great hands. That's fantastic. Look, I'm sorry, I'm just a little nervous about giving that much money to someone I never met on the internet. Ah! See, the scene is just, it's going on for way too long. This was the final straw for EJ, who finally decides that he's going to enlist the help of Alex and his friends. The guys are pretty reluctant, but they end up cutting a deal with EJ, who finally describes to them what the app is actually going to do. Basically, we use GE's cloud technology to monitor the town's power grid. When demand surges, everybody's devices turn off. Okay, so not that they have a choice, but who would willingly agree to this? I can think of a variety of situations where this would cause a problem. Oh no, someone broke into my house. Time to call 911. Oh, wait. Yeah, man, I was looking at the, those dividends. Those look great. I love the dividends. When we are able to add and subtract things like that, it's great, you know. So after all is said and done, the movie does another super monotonous montage that features coding and this guy, Nine, that Alex meets in a park. I feel like I didn't talk nearly enough about this Nine guy. First of all, his name is Nine. There's police cars. How could I have ignored the fact that he literally, I, I think he lives in a, in a children's playground. That's weird. And also he writes party at Alex Finn's in the sky. Assuming everyone knows who Alex Finn is. Disaster. Okay. During this, EJ pitches his app at the office, claiming that they're going to launch the app at a state-of-the-art shutdown party, which if you told me that today, I'd think you're talking about January 6th, part two. When EJ shares this idea with Alex, Alex gets super upset and thinks that EJ's making this all about him. But to ensure Alex that everything is going fine, EJ says, Let me show you how a CEO gets things done. You're just not a CEO, dude. The film has actually proven to us multiple times so far just how incapable of basic life you are. This launches us into yet another Another confusing sequence, which is a low budget tutorial video on how to throw a party. It's shot like a school project and it's just super dumb. But somehow everyone starts to find out about the party, including Lyft, like with the cars. But based on Alex's reply, I'm gonna assume that he has no idea what Lyft even is. That doesn't matter though, because now Alex is the big cheese, walking through the hallways looking like an absolute moron. Alexander Finn! Oh boy. Turns out that even Mr. Eskin has caught word of the party, but what's more concerning to me right now is the fact that I'm having to watch a one-on-one -on -one scene between Brent Rivera and Jason Nash. Not gonna bust your party, dude. Really? You're not? Dude, come on! Who do you remember who you're talking to? Yeah, I remember. A criminal. I do need to ask you a question. Okay. And I need you to be 100% straight with me. Okay, all right. Is it cool if I roll through? Wow, man, this film is aged horribly. Now it's time to get ready for the party. Alex and Stu test out outfits together, and then the most horrific thing of all time happens. I just wanted to give you a kiss. Oh, hello. I love you. 
If the idea is for Alex to get the girl in the end, we have to want to root for him, right? How are we supposed to do that when he's planning to shut her up mid-sentence and send her to Suck City? After trying on about six different outfits, Alex decides on a plain black shirt. Holy shit. Right before party time, they have a little powwow in the living room where we get our first and only funny interaction in the movie. Work in security, man. Keep everybody out of the front yard, make sure that nobody gets in unless they've downloaded the app and their data is disabled. No disabled people, got it. It's not what I said. Right before EJ leaves though, they discover a pretty major issue with the app. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? We have full access to people's phones. Well, that's not great. EJ heads out for his big business dinner, and let me tell you, he rides the absolute fuck out of this escalator. Okay, now back to the app issue. Do you think that they're going to handle it responsibly or not? Let me hit a lick and just get like five minutes to peruse a few girls' albums. No. Based on a recently watch on Netflix, we got Rick and Morty, no. Archer, Parks and Rec, and no. Workaholics. She likes all the same shows I do. Okay, well, congratulations on naming four shows, none of which are on Netflix. Also, if Rick and Morty is on that list, you better be ready for her to whip out one of these bad boys. And for those who know, that's a very, very bad thing to own. But I guess that's all it took for Alex to quickly change his mind and furiously scroll through Lowe's phone like he's playing Subway Surfers. Back over at the dinner, EJ, real CEO, by the way, struggles to get an internet connection and does the classic phone to the sky for Wi-Fi. Bit. It's not a revolutionary bit by any means, so I'd like to know why it goes on for a total of 25 seconds. The big, big boss loves it though, so just let's hope that goes well for him. Our business is like a shark. If we're not moving forward, we die, which is why I'm always looking for the next big thing. Carrie! Yeah, so he's a maniac, and for the rest of the movie, that's about all this character does, so we're just gonna leave him be. The other guy they're meeting, who's a writer for some reason, brings up the question that we've all been having. Every kid I know is glued to their phones. How are you gonna make them turn them off? Look, I was part of the last generation to grow up without the internet. That's a stretch. Okay, if this movie takes place in 2017 and he's supposed to be 24, that means he was born in 1993. The internet was technically created in 1989, and if we wanna get more specific, Google was created in 1998. So by the time he was in high school, the internet had already been advancing at a rapid rate, but EJ seems to want us to think that he was off fighting world wars. Somehow though, he ends up convincing them, leading us to our first lesson in the film, lying is good. Back at the house, the party is pumping. And by that, I mean everyone is doing the same up and down dance motion. It's it's very unsettling. Alex walks into a room and there's a bunch of people giving massages and doing like Reiki treatment. What happens next, I can't really put into words, but this guy essentially possesses Stu and that makes Alex... Tonight, you're a man. AJ. I swear to God, I'm not taking this clip out of context. In fact, this is the second time in one film that we've had to watch Brent Rivera We've been throwing bangers like this for a minute. <laughs> awesome. Here, come on, I'll tell you all about it. Great. Uh, that works, by the way, because they immediately go upstairs and... Ew! Then Alex pulls out his stalker material and attempts to relate to love. So, uh, what TV shows do you like? Because, you know, I'm a big fan of Parks and Rec. Ricky and Morty, Workaholics, and Archer. Wow, man, you sure know how to light up a conversation. Also, if Rick and Morty is truly one of your favorite shows, then what's with this Ricky and Morty business? Ricky and Morty. It would make sense if he was trying to intentionally act dumb, but that's the exact opposite of what he's trying to do. And trust me, I've looked at this from every single angle, but since it's starting to make me angry, we're just gonna give this one the seal of idiocy. And it turns out that I made the right choice because these aren't Lowe's favorite shows, they're her little brothers. So that for me, raises two questions. Number one, whose phone was he looking at? And number two, why was he getting so excited? We've got bigger problems at this moment though because the grumpy old neighbor is coming over to gauge the vibes. You gotta end the party now, man. Stop playing, tell everybody to go home. I got an idea. Ah, evidence. You know, at this point, the film, it just has to be canon to real life. I, I mean, Jason Nash is, uh, he's playing himself. But here's what they do, and it's really stupid. When the neighbor comes to the door, Alex holds him off while Mr. Eskin gets into position behind the blind. Considering the fact that he's only seen in silhouette, you'd think they'd just have him speak through the window, but no. Do the boys have some people over because I've been hearing this noise. No, we're about to hit the hay. Are you sure? No, 
We're about to hit the head. Oh, so it's a recording. Then why, pray tell, did you have to use Mr. Eskin of all people? I'd say there's a solid 50 people at this party. That's a, that's a low estimation. So I don't understand why they didn't just grab the closest guy. This movie has a horrible habit of setting up situations that could make complete sense, yet they choose to try and take what they believe to be the funny route, and it just ends up being bad. When that all works out, the next two minutes of the film are taken up by the entirety of another bad song. Now, two minutes doesn't seem like a long time, but when you consider the fact that this isn't a musical and it's nothing but a party montage, uh, it gets pretty boring. So let's read the lyrics to this song. Oh boy, here we go. Dance when the bass hit. Dab on a spaceship. Me and all my homies going hard. I'm hella high, bruh. I cannot lie, bruh. I've got that mad look in my eye, bruh. Pretty saucy stuff, yeah, yeah. But there's two more lines that I just need to point out. Got your main thing looking at us like, what's up? Spinning all these bad soldiers. What in God's name could that mean? And just to prove to you that I'm not making this up, I'm gonna play that last line, that little sliver. At the end of the dinner, EJ, at the last minute, decides to drop the fact that the shutdown party they're going to is, in fact, a high school party. Now that's what I call a killer instinct, huh? All right, folks, there's another criminal for the list. Hater Ash Jonathan is not letting this one slide, though, so he narks on the party. I'd like to report an out-of-control party next door. Yeah, definitely underage drinking possible drugs. Hey, at least this guy knows how a high school party works. Back at the party, an announcement is made that the three hours of shutdown time has officially ended. Mr. Eskin freaks out and encourages the crowd to continue the shutdown, and then the most painfully corny moment in any movie I've ever watched commences. Hey, before you power down, do you want to take a selfie? Definitely. Okay, so what I want you to do is just take me out to see the flowers and then just drive that nail gun into the back of my head. Anyway, this is happening in the bathroom. You're so sexy. Can we ignore that and move on? Cool. Up in Alex's room, the guys have an argument about the fact that the party is going exactly how they wanted it to, which is, once again, I, fucking whatever. Unfortunately for them, Cole overhears the fact that they've been snooping on Lowe's phone, so he immediately tells her. I'm sorry you had to find out like this. I know, it's just... I thought he was one of the good guys. He's not a good guy. He plays League of Legends and he jacks off and that's it. In fact, he probably does both at the same time. Right as EJ and his crew show up, Mr. Eskin prepares for his one-way ticket to jail right as the cops show up. Don't tase me, bro! Get out! Don't tase me, bro! That was the first body in Facebook! Well, that sucked. The morning after, EJ and Alex, who now has no friends, by the way, have a brotherly conversation that I don't care about. Then their parents return home and everything goes off without a hit. Back at school, Alex does this slow-mo walk past a bunch of people and they all look at him like he's wearing a shirt covered in slurs. Because of this, Alex goes recluse mode for the next 24 hours, backed by a song that just says, you can trust me with your body over and over again. And when you put a song in a movie, it's supposed to make sense, by the way. But here we are. The day has finally come to give the multimedia me presentation. When it's time for Alex to go up, he attempts to make amends with his peers by giving a presentation that just makes him look like a fool. In doing so, I realized I'm not Cool. Yeah, no shit, buddy. Look at some of these photos he pulls out. We got Titanic, LOL, Nerd Alert, and this picture, which is clearly just a photo of the guy playing Stu with Brent Rivera photoshopped in. God, talk about a meaningful friendship, huh? All of a sudden, EJ's business people show up, and then Alex's speech transitions into an Apple-esque keynote speech. Perhaps I should cut the esque, though, because here comes EJ dressed as Steve Jobs. Then guess what happens? Alex appears again, dressed as Steve Jobs. Together they reveal a shocking statistic that is that in just one night, they managed to get over 10,000 app downloads only by word of mouth. How? And that's basically how the movie ends. EJ gets his project funded and Alex managed to win back the trust of his friends, dressed as Steve Jobs. But do you wanna know what happens at the very end? Selfie time. Let's just live in the moment. Nah! Yo, get it right here. Uh, wait, so, um, what? So you mean to tell me that the entire point of this film was to encourage people to put their phones down every now and then, but at the end they just say, uh, nah? Well, I'm in shambles. But that's all I got for you today. No sponsor, fuck it. As always, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and comment and subscribe and uh, unsubscribe from Brent Rivera. You know, surprisingly, I didn't get to hate on Brent in the actual movie nearly as much as I thought I did. I really just didn't like Nathan Cress's character. Everyone else was just either really bad or just not important enough to talk about, so. But guys, look, I'm awesome now. There's no microphone in view, so you just get to see me 
and I got a sign with my name on it. As always, that's all I have for you today, folks. But until next time... Guys, I just looked it up. Jason Nash is 49. My God.